pathway on the other side, part of our pathway um, on the other side is building a, an augmented reality district of learning in downtown Washington, DC. Um, and really looking at augmented reality as the technology that you know merges people and technology and physical communities. So I, I try to explain this. Hopefully that was at least a start. I'll put some links that in the chat. a lot. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michael. <clears throat> and I just showed uh, a little bit about Michael in my brain and uh, also the BitLattice project, which is part of uh, uh, what Michael wanted to talk about a bit in, among, among friends who care about platforms and, and things like that. Um, so uh, shall we dive into that? Do, do, do we want to sort of check in a little bit? Um, I'd love to hear uh, who, um, who else I'm talking with, too. I mean, I, I guess you all know each other. Uh, sure, we, we, we've been hanging a while in, the, in these Zooms. Um, a quick round of intros. Um, Hank, you want uh, hey, to? I have a suggestion that some yes. of everybody, uh, 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 everybody encapsulates somebody else real quick. So uh, oh, Michael Grossman <laughs> is a technologist, business, business person, uh, maybe not in that order. Um, and he runs a cool social bookmarking site uh, called um, Factor, uh, F-A-C-T-R. Um, very, very uh, interesting, thoughtful, like he's, he's one of the thoughtful people, um, comes up with um, nice pointed, stuff and he's got a background in not technology and not business as much uh, so um, he's kind of a little bit more artsy awesome um, michael do you want to take a swing <laughs> so that's a, a tough act to follow I, don't, I know i know <laughs> i know as much about anybody as pete just said about me um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try you, Jerry, just because I've known you the longest, um, though barely, uh, and say uh, Jerry is, uh, is someone who looks at everything in the world and, and tries to um, map it in his brain and figure out what it means and uh, meet the people who he's... Um, uh, mapping around when whenever he can, uh, and uh, has has made more connections in in both senses of that word than anybody else I know. I think, um, and um, yeah, cool. Thanks, Ms. Jerry. Thanks. Uh, Stacy is an adventurer with us uh, who cares really, really deeply about the community side of all the things we're talking about and also kind of uh, media explorations and is trying to figure out how to motivate us to come together in possibly game-like formations so that we can make serious play out of assembling how the world works and finding our way back to discourse and dialogue and solving the world's problems. Um, I use that. Yeah, <laughs> Can I sure. use that? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's now recorded, and, and Pete's going to yeah, get like well transcripts. Well, so. Recorded. It's it's nice. Oh, how about that? Um, and, I, and I don't know if you can do Hank, but if you can give <laughs> Hank a swing. I feel terrible because I was going to say, I don't like this game. I'm taking my ball, and I'm just going to stay here. Hank, you want to help me? <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I can do Hank, too. How about that? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that, that's the hard part about this game. Um, so Hank is in Amsterdam and is a futurist who cares a lot about positive cartography. Uh, and uh, he sort of every decade kind of there's a phrase that, that characterizes his work, uh, but he's involved, uh, he's been involved in several future centers uh, and kind of global futures networks, uh, works a lot with Leif Edvinson and he, he and Leif and I have a, a standing call uh, early Mondays. Um, and the positive cartography thing resonates really nicely with open global mind and the stuff that we're doing here. So we've been trying to find different kinds of overlaps because <clears throat> um, positive thinking in a, in a dire situation is likely going to be a good thing. Uh, Hank, uh, let me let me know how many things I missed, but I'm sure I missed a lot. Well, I think for this game, that that's enough anyway. 
And that leaves me to, to talk about Pete and introduce Pete. Pete is the evil genius of uh, technology. Oh my God, he, so good. <laughs> he knows uh, so much more about technology and uh, than I do because I can't even find the words to describe it. Uh, he is working with setting up uh, a massive wiki. He loves programs like uh, Obsidian, uh, but I understand from the conversations of the last eight or nine months, he's so eager to try new things that if anyone suggests something, New, he'll immediately look it up on uh, somewhere on internet, post a link to it, and have mastered it in the chat, and have mastered it by the next time we meet. How's that? <laughs> awesome. And if and if the camera, if the frame were to pan back, you'd see that underneath his hands are like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank thank you. I, I I apologize a little bit for for uh, bringing that game up. Uh, some of us have kind of an unfair advantage. We know more about uh, uh, folks than other people. Worked out well. um, I have a, but on the other hand, it's a good a good exercise, I think, and, and we're <laughs> kind of friendly enough that it didn't explode. I have another one. Maybe we should try real quick, uh, which is a little bit less unfair. Which is, uh, if, uh, we we ask each other a question, so each person gets to answer a question from somebody else. Um, so I'll go first. Is this um, like truth or dare? Um, I don't Just think kidding. so, but um, uh, Michael, what, what brings you here today? Um, I Let's am Michael's on the call. Ah, sorry, oh, yeah. Michael Robbins. Yeah, what brings you uh, here today? Um, Jerry um, and I were emailing last night. I'm really struggling. Um, I, um, you know, it, six years of exploration has also been six years of failure. And, um, you know, I feel like I'm out of time, out of money, out of energy, and, um, and I, I, I need help. Uh, and your co-founder recently had a crisis in the family. I'm forgetting exactly what happened. Her father died. Yeah, her father was an accident and died. And, you know, it's, um, you know, just because of all the, um, you know, all the challenges, like the two of us are even having problems communicating, much less communicating this to, to anyone else. Um, we get, the great thing is that, you know, this big complicated, you know, stuff up, I guess, um, people have, you know, we've been able to talk to people who understand bits and pieces of it. And, and everyone who sees it is like, yes, like this piece makes sense. Um, you know, we have to do this. You're right. Or, he, you know, here's some other ideas. Like, but, but there's nobody who really can like grok the full picture. Um, and it's very, it's a very lonely place to be. You're not alone anymore. <laughs> um, par partly because we've been on that journey, like together for this whole thing. Uh, I don't know how much it overlaps <clears throat> with your quest, but, uh, uh, but we're like, that's what we've been chewing on here for since the beginning of lockdown, actually. So happy. To, and can you talk a little bit about the, the technical, uh, the technical aspect that BitLab, we'll come back to it because I think we want to do around like Pete just said, which would be interesting. Um, but can you talk for a moment about the technical aspects of BitLattice and what brought you here about that? Yeah, so, um, you know, if you're familiar with a Mohs surgery for skin cancer, you know, if you're, if you're not, it's where they it's, cut up, yeah, basal skill carcinoma and then slice a layer and look under the microscope. Is there still cancer there? Okay, we need to dig deeper. Is there still cancer? We need to dig deeper. Um, and, you know, before long, things are gushing. And, but, you know, it's just been, been this process of like, if we're going to build a platform, we have to, bit, you know, build, go down to bedrock. And this bedrock is not just on the technology side, it's on the human network side. And so BitLabs has been the evolution of my, you know, 18 month quest on distributed ledger technology um, that, um, you know, started off with, you know, Kira Finlow Bates and, um, and Linda Getz of the Blockchain Chamber of Commerce and, you know, um, and a number of other, you know, Charlie Northrup, if anyone knows Charlie, who, 
um, was the founder of e-commerce and has developed solutions on self-sovereign identity, Michael Darden. He was just a whole litany of people. And you know, I finally got to um, Hedera, um, Hedera Hashgraph, um, and really excited about it. I'll post links to all of this in the, um, in the chat. Um, got to Hedera. Um, it's a consensus ledger. It's a consensus algorithm. It, um, the transactional costs, um, both financial and environmental, are less than what we see on the Visa network. Um, and they launched a billion dollar foundation, but it's still, you know, it's still OPP. It's still other people's platforms. You know, they have a governance council and, you know, all the things that you want from a, a technology company, right? But, you know, transparency and ethics and explainability aren't enough to build democracy. I mean, this is, you know, this is the Jedi Council, right? This is the, you know, the well-meaning WC3, the standards bodies. This is not how we build something from the bottom up. And so then I, um, and so then I got introduced to um, a fellow named Subu uh, Joyce, who, um, who was at Hedera and left and built um, from the ground up a platform called Autograph, and it's a it's a triple ledger, um, uh, you know, distributed system, built in many of the same ways as um, as Hedera, um, but still, you know, like my where I've gotten to is that we can't just build a solution for a human network. We have to build it with them. They have to understand it. They have to trust it. It has to be integrated with the human network in order for these, um, you know, these arches to, to, to come up and meet each other. I have a, a visual that I will share um, on this um, about these three pillars. Um, and then, you know, in a conversation just like three days ago, um, you know, I started engaging with the anonymous, um, you know, genius, precise, on the spectrum um, inventor of, of, of bit lattice. Um, and I'll share a couple links on that. And I finally saw something like that, oh gosh, this is where we could start. Like we need a different starting point. And so that's, that's where we are with bit lattice. I'm, I've been engaging in conversation with them um, and, um, and you know they're they've um, they've and I and just you know I'm pronouns um, minor he she I'm gender fluid I'm using them to describe somebody who's um, you know I don't know their gender um, so um, so they um, you know they're they're genius um, we've been talking there's some things I, I disagree with um, but need to explain but I think that BitLadis could be that bedrock um, on, on a ledger side. And in fact, what we're calling our, our ledger initiative is, um, is ledger, L-E-J-E-R, um, uh, ledger for uh, equality, sorry, for ledger for equity, justice, and, uh, and economic rights, because it becomes more than just a distributed ledger for an education system, a learning system, it really, it's how do we look at how, uh, a, a different kind of um, a value exchange model. My work for a long time has been on blended value initiatives um, and um, uh, you know, social return on investment analysis and those things. Um, and then you know, if we are able to build ledger, then, um, then on top of that, what evolves is what we're calling Daphne. And, um, and Daphne is, is the knowledge network. Um, it comes from the, um, the Greek myth of Apollo and Daphne, where Daphne was transformed into a laurel tree to escape the lustful um, pursuits of Apollo. But Daphne stands for um, distributed application, um, human network exchange. Um, and it, it becomes, you know, sort of the ecosystem that's, you know, this Daphne quest is where I, um, I ended up, I think, Jerry, where you're, you're in my conversation started, um, looking at knowledge networks yep. and some of those things. Yep. Um, thanks, Michael. That, that's a nice background for the different moving parts and we can come back to it, but you get to ask anybody you want a question right now. Ah, uh, um, 
Hmm. It's turned into a game show. It's kind of cool. Yeah, it is. Um, Stacy, um, you know, I'm interested in, in games. We've been exploring things with games for change and, um, and game designers and, I've been thinking about our augmented reality work is like a, a a Pokemon Go for learning that's owned by kids by all the kids in the neighborhood. Um, how are you thinking about game development um, and like distributed application organizations? Is that too much to ask? Oh, uh, you're on uh, mute. You're muted. Yeah. So yeah, some of that is, but let me be clear. I'm more interested in what motivates people to engage. So instead of game, I, I'm, I think I'm really more about play and what makes people want to add to it and, and create. So I'm interested in what you're talking about very much so, but I don't know that I could help more than that. Yeah, then then let, let's maybe talk about that. I mean, you know, learn, you know, we have a, a situation right now with return to schools where like people are talking about you know the solution to learning loss is high intensity tutoring which brings to mind gavage um where they you know Ooh, nice everybody know what gavage is forced yeah. feeding of geese to make foie gras oh. yeah um and yeah and you know, that's the opposite of play right and yeah, yeah, yeah. um so how, how do you get people who are just so focused on like oh drill and kill to uh, in whatever form that is to stop and say, hey, we got to do this differently. You know, I've been thinking a lot about that because I've been watching myself and I think a lot of it has to do with where a person feels they could actually add value, if that makes any sense. Um, I have to think more on that. I don't know that I could just answer yeah, no, fair enough. I just, that's, a, it's a big question. And just apropos foie gras, because I think you just sort of reached into your mind and plucked that out, but it's really interesting because there's a TED talk by Dan Barber uh, about a chef who loves foie gras and hates gavage. He hates sort of the torturing of geese. So he went and bought a piece of land in Spain that was beautiful and turned it into paradise for geese. And he, he makes sure that lots and lots of geese come and fatten up on their own, on their own dime on his piece of territory. Then he harvests a few and sells off uh, that foie gras, which has become prized <coughs> among chefs. Um, so I've used this metaphorically to say, how do you, how do you create you know, heaven for blank, uh, for programmers, for kids, for people trying to, to solve the world situation, which is a, a bit of a macabre metaphor because you're going to harvest them. But I don't mean the harvesting of organs or people. I just mean, how do you create a place so enticing that people want to come and play in the way that Stacy's talking about? And I think a part of that is about making hard work playful and enjoyable together, uh, and but focusing on difficult things. And I'm, I'm really struck by how many trivial things we're wasting our freaking time on these days. And I would love if we spent a third of those cycles um, on meaningful <laughs> stuff. And, and yeah. so there's an interesting, interesting bridge there. Yeah, there's also this, you know, this concept of abundance, right? That's um, and right now, you know, in our digital world, where everyone's doing their best to create artificial sca scarcity because that's the economic model that people understand. Um, cool. So, Stacy, you get to ask anybody a question or answer as you were just about to. I, I was just going to say something about. Um, I see recycling in there like just reusing and recycling. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll just, <laughs> I have a question. Oh, now I have to think of a question. <laughs> um, geez. My God. I'm going to go back to this answer about education. One of the things is looking at the emotional state of the learner. <laughs> while they're learning. That's a big deal. And that's something that, that, that I can speak to because when I'm nervous, like now, I can't think. But when I'm just doing and being and I'm in the flow, I could talk for hours. So. Uh, Stacy, there's a, there's a cheat for this game. Um, What's the which, cheat? Which in, in good play, like 
and, and education now that I think about it, although you have to watch with what you have to be careful with education. Um, uh, cheating artfully is is not necessarily a bad thing. You know, cheating gets a bad rap and sometimes rightfully so, but um, art, artfully bending the rules of the game so that so that something more productive happens is is not necessarily a bad thing. So the cheat, um, and by that I don't mean a bad thing, I mean a good thing uh, for this game is to ask somebody a question where you know they where where they talk about that that topic a lot already. So um, it's it's a way to so for this game, I think of it as not a way for me to query other people and put them on the spot or learn something I've always wanted to know, but rather for people who are new in the space to hear the things that we always talk about. And um, you'll you'll ask you can ask somebody a question where you've heard this you've heard their story a bunch of times already. Um, but you know that they can tell the story really well. And then maybe that's the question that you ask. So you see, you just you just pointed out something for me. Now I know what the goal is. I think the reason it was hard to do it is I was given a task to ask a question, but I'm not really sure in what direction I'm trying to throw the stone. Yep. Yep. It's like what is the what is the fifteenth prime of twelve or something? It's like what? <laughs> um, and 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 so a question that you, that you might ask is is like since we just did a round of intros, it's like so Hank, tell us more about positive cartography. Which would be kind I'll of a layup for for Hank because you can you can push that button and Hank Hank can go. Was that a real question or just an example? I'll <laughs> use that. I'll take it. That's my cheat. I'm taking. I, I, it. Actually, say it, Stacy. Actually, um, yeah. I don't even remember what he just said. Um, can you tell us more about positive cartography? Okay, great. Uh, well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you the the tomorrow's version. Uh, positive cartography is a way to uh, encourage and inspire people to really think about the future they desire to live in and what steps they can take to, uh, to help realize it. And at the moment, it's a work in progress. It's a, it's a, a prototype in, in its second uh, phase, but I'm hoping that in the next nine months, it becomes something that's so attractive uh, and compelling to use that it'll be adapted, sorry, adopted and adapted by people all over the world to help, to help them discover what they really want to do in life. How's that? Very yeah. aspirational, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, no, um, Hank, it sounds a bit like um, like motivational interviewing. Um, you know, from um, I, I'm on the. I also happen to be on the journey of recovery from um, from uh, you know ad addiction, and you know, it's we're we're addicted to a certain way of thinking, and you know, is is this who we are? Is this who we want to be in the mirror? What are we doing? Where are we heading? Um, I, I've been, um, I dug in last night into um, um, aviation graveyard spirals um, and the physics behind that and, and instrument flight readings. And, you know, it's, um, it, it happens when people are, are flying by the seat of their pants. Um, and, you know, it's, you, you look at the horizons, you look at your instruments, and that's what, um, that's what gets you out. Um, we are collectively in a trauma-fueled graveyard spiral now. So. Totally. That's, that's very interesting. I'm, I'm not familiar with motivational interview and I'll, I'll try to learn more about it. The, the, it could be very similar. Uh, the prototypes for positive cartography at the moment involve people who join a session because they know me or they know someone in the network who's joining it, but they're not a real community. And ideally it's being developed for communities to work to find out together what they want. Because I think if anything's going to change in the world, it's not going to be just individuals uh, doing it in their own ad hoc ways, but communities doing the things that are important to the communities together. 
So it might be very, very interesting to, to have a look what this motivational, uh, motivational Inter interviewing interviewing is. Yeah, thank you. Ah, okay. I have a question. I have a question. I have a All question. Right. The game oh, well, okay. Let's 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 throw uh, the as they say in Dutch. I, I live in the Netherlands, as they say in Dutch. Let's throw the rooster in the uh, the the hen house. Uh, Jerry, Jerry, if you had a magic wand, and uh, you had thirty seconds to decide. Which of all the ambitions and aspirational ideas that you've been discussing with this group in the last year or more, you could realize tomorrow, which would that be? Um, do, does the wish include changing people's hearts or does the wish just include like putting things in motion? Because if, up yeah, to you. If it's changing people, I yeah, know. If it's changing people's hearts, it's like um, I would cause, I would cause some mechanism to to help like half the world's population learn to design from trust, and to redesign all of our institutions organically from from wherever they are, uh, in whatever way they are, because that yeah. would solve a whole bunch of issues that would just bubble up and bubble down and go all over the place. So so I'll put a link to design from trust on that. Yeah, in the chat, but um, I would do that. Thanks for the question. Good question. Um, Mr. Grossman, since we have two Michaels. Um, what's the thing that excites you most about the possibilities for the people you are trying to serve with the company you've started and other neighboring ventures or ideas. It's interesting because it, it th there's a way in which it ties in with the, the uh, quote that, that I heard, you know, probably not exactly correctly from from the other Michael that we were just um, exchanging about in, in chat. Um, the thing that excites me most is the idea that everyone, well, everyone is a tall order, but as many people as possible and a growing number of people have have informationally a view of their own instruments and a sense of control of what they're, what, what they see, um, you know, being able to filter out the noise, um, what they save and sort of make a part of them and what they share and with whom. Um, you know, setting up mechanics for people to have that sense of control and focus um, over what they do and, and who they do it with and, and, you know, who permeates their, their field of focus. Um, just that idea seems so grounding and important to me that that's that's the thing that excites me most, I think. Um, cool, thank you. And, and it's interesting also how the, it sounds like sort of a cockpit view of information in the sense that uh, uh, resonates. Yeah, you wouldn't wanna, wanna be a pilot trying to um, uh, you know, pilot your plane by trying to pick out the relevant data from a uh, feed that was trying to hold your attention. That wouldn't be good. Um, yeah. um, they yeah. were having trouble with, with uh, Navy pilots landing on aircraft carriers at night. 
this is many years ago when this was a, a new thing, and they realized that the Navy pilots were so freaking worried about landing on a little postage stamp in the middle of the ocean and otherwise dying, uh, that they were looking at the at the at the at the aircraft carrier and fixating on it, and then the the sort of negative spiral happened. But also the 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 image of the aircraft carrier was imprinting on their retinas, so that as they looked around, they they were disoriented that the, the image was moving with them instead of the actual carrier. So they had to train them to look away and glance back uh, on their on their approach and figure out you know orient themselves better and differently. Yeah, um, uh, Jerry, interesting. My father was a F four fighter pilot. Um, and flew oh, the, yeah. last, the last squadron of the F fours built in Navy. Um, they had, um, you know, the the first with look at lock on sighting and had a, a early heads up display, and so I think a lot about that, and I think about like like that was augmented reality, right? What what what's the power of augmented reality to give us that information in context um, in our communities? Yep, yep, love that. And, and we have target fixation in lots of different ways metaphorically in our lives. So I think that the, you know, this, the whole flying lessons broadens out nicely into, into the rest of our lives. Uh, Michael, do you want to ask a question of someone else? Oh, please, Stacey, jump in. I wanted to ask more Carranza the same question that Hank asked you, Jerry, which is if you mm. could, you know, in 30 seconds, what would be the thing that you would like to see come into realization? Gonna run out of fingers really soon. Can you expand on that? <laughs> um. <laughs> you know, peace in the Middle East, that'll work. So this is your just your your wish list for for global harmony in some sense. So it's interesting that Mark should mention peace as part of this pathway embedded is my work um, in um, peace studies and conflict resolution. And, you know, it's, it's how do we create a pathway from conflict to peace? Because that's what we're experiencing now. And so, and, you know, I have a, a very close Palestinian friend who we talk about this quite a bit. Um, you know, there's uh, the Arbinger Institute's work, if you're not familiar with them, um, which came out of Middle East conflict is, um, is work that Cecily and I have been turning to, we turned to last week. Um, so, it, you know, it is, it is related. Um, um, Mark, do you want to ask anybody a question? Um, hi, Stacy. Um, thanks for that question. Um, let's see. Has anybody not been asked a question? I don't. I, I have not. Pete, Pete has not oh. been asked a question. Um, Pete, what's, what's, and this what's, is like the Oracle of Delphi, not him having been asked a question. It's a little bit like, geez. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite color? Um, <laughs> It used to be blue when I was a kid, and, and now I don't really have a favorite color. I, I sometimes contemplate about that. So I, I like I like the fact that colors exist, but I'm not particularly attracted to one color. Thank you. Um, I asked that, and my best answer that I got was the color of water, That's which good, I had never thought of before. It's like an incredible answer. Um, but thank you. The, the the answer to the question, why is the sky blue and why is water blue is like freaking fascinating. Because they're not, neither of them is naturally actually blue. Uh, it, it's all about molecular reactions and light and all that kind of stuff. And I, I, I know nothing about the physics of it, but it's just like fascinating. I'm gonna jump in just um, because the way things worked, I didn't get to ask a question because um, it, Stacy asked Mark the question from Hank when I would have asked my question. So I'll throw out uh, a question for Michael, who I don't think has gotten a question. Have you, or did you? Did we start with you? I, yeah, I think it started with me. I don't think I got it. Okay, a okay. Then, then never mind. I'm good. <laughs> no, no. I, mean, I think I, I, I asked. Closing I mean, the loop. 
Yeah, maybe I asked the first question. I, I lost track. Testicular navigation? Okay. Is that near the, is I'm that, surprised is that, you haven't heard that, that about that, Trey. No, does testicular, that come testicular testicular navigation. I like that term. It's, it's li <laughs> very literal. Yeah, it um, is literal. Um, and I think about like, with augmented reality, right? Are we going to have gesticular uh, navigation, right? When someone says, call me, they're like, you know, call me, or like, this is the the sign for texting. Like, what's gonna be when we're talking about augmented reality? Like, do this. <laughs> yeah, augment me. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so, so we're, we've, we've, We've gone through three quarters of our time together, um, and I'd love to do a brief conversation either about BitLattice or about some other aspect of building OGM sort of stuff. Um, and I do like gesticular navigation. <clears throat> and the idea, the, you know, the, the gesture interfaces, the original interface was the point and grunt interface, I heard someone say long ago, which I really liked. What was the first item, Jerry? Uh, bit lattice, which is partly what brought Michael into this uh, conversation because he pinged me yesterday about uh, conversations he's having with uh, a person named Hybrida uh, or Hybrida. I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. Uh, and is working with a blockchain alternative named Bit, who, who, whose research is in this blockchain alternative called Bit Lattice. Uh, as a distributed ledger, ledger technology. And then lots of different DLTs, distributed ledger technologies. Uh, and so um, that was part of the question. And I'm, now that we've got a, a, a bit of a gathering of geeks, um, I thought maybe we'd go back into the topic for a little bit. Uh, and before we escape testosterone poisoning, uh, I, one of my beliefs is that most of the world's problems are caused by TIMR, which is probably like not a, not a it's probably politically incorrect these days, but TIMR is the testosterone induced mental retardation. Thing. This goes back, goes back a long ways. Pete, yeah, you know, you also, um, I mean, I've been thinking about this, like, like what are the axes that we, what are the things that induce aggression, right? Um, and, and I've been digging into the, to Curtin's adaption, I, innovation uh adaption innovation um continuum um i'll put some things in the chat on that but it you know looks it's um it, it's um, a framework um sort of psychometric uh, framework that um uh, that i've been exploring deeply over the last couple of months and it's the reason why why marketers say new and improved um that some people want new and some people want improved and um, <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah, it's and, and it's, you know, I'll put more in. It's really interesting. I think it's also instructive, not just from um, like a descriptive, but from a, an actionable perspective, like in a, in a world where people are feeling out of control, where people are feeling, you know, I I've talked about this pandemic of powerlessness, um, you know, how are they responding differently? Right. You know. We could say there's the the male female axis, which you know, as someone who believes gender is a construct, I'm not um, I'm not really fixated on that. Um, but this adaption innovation thing, I think, is is really an interesting axis for looking at, you know, how how we um, how people respond to difficult situations. Thank you. I'd forgotten I'd ever seen that. And so it's interesting to, to sort of rediscover that in my brain and something I'm else very, to look into. And, and whatever, whatever links you put will be interesting. Go ahead, Michael. I'm just very curious about that, the, that concept of, of the idea, and I may be misinterpreting you, Michael, but um, the, the, the notion that there are two desirable things, that thing we've never seen before, that's the magic bullet that's gonna solve everything in a way that nobody else ever has. And that thing with deep roots in all the things that have come before it, that is a perfection of something that people have been working toward, um, that's, you know, 
built on the shoulders of, of everyone. Um, and and one's, the first is kind of messianic. And I feel like you see a lot of it in the tech world of, I've got this thing, nobody's ever thought of it. Um, and so many of us are trying to like pull the threads together, which is much, much harder in a way and also is fraught with the, uh, yeah, well, but this was, we, there, are, there are people in the past who have thought some good things, but do we wanna build on sh the shoulders of people who we now look at questioningly because of their white male Europeanness, or, you know, they're, they're just, it, both are fraught. I, I'm, not, I'm not like <laughs> yeah. for one or the other, it's just interesting. No, and it, you know, it's that, and technology, you know, is, and you know, it, adaption innovation is distributed on a, on a normal curve. Um, it, I, I am, as I imagine many of you are, like, you know, two plus standard deviations from the mean on the innovative side. But I've spent my career working in those adaptive neighborhoods and situations and systems and our education systems are, are built for adaption, right? They're actually built to help people adapt to the world as it exists. Meanwhile, you know, technology is racing ahead. And so like the responses to trauma, right? You know, it's just, let's do disruptive innovation. <laughs> Education's like, screw you. We are disrupted enough, thank you, right? And so where does that leave us? Crypto, right? You know, I've been calling crypto kudzu. It's a non-native invasive species. I mean, DeFi is the future, but like decentralized monetary policy is a it's a ticking time bomb. Um, you know, it is it. You know, it's pretending to be democratic. It's pretending to be centralized. It's elitist. It's autocratic. All these horrible things. We can fix it, but we have to do it with people and not for them, right? Artificial intelligence. We're seeing that same thing, right? AI racing ahead instead of building it with, you know, cognitive neural networks. It's this, it's this separation, it's rocket ships and bridges, right? And, you know, during the pandemic, we see billionaire space barons going to space powered by our data and their rocket ships. Meanwhile, you know, education standing at the cliff, looking over saying, you know, bye, sorry, how do we get there? I love that um, comparison. Thank you, Michael. Um, the uh, question of the difference in actual knowing how to do something and knowing how to organize to do something. We know how to go to Mars. We don't know how to fix the uh, uh, elementary school system in America. It's a, such a different kind of problem. Um, this and is why I would make everybody learn design from trust and, and implement it, is that it would actually flip the education system, among other things. Hmm. So trust. Let's just put a pin in that word and come back. Sorry to interrupt, Mark. Okay. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, yep. I'm asked, can I ask you to expand on that, Jerry? Because I'm unfamiliar with um, why that um, work or oh sure so yeah. I, 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 there's a nice story here i got radicalized on this 25 years ago when doc searles mailed me in the physical mail uh an issue of the sun uh, i'm pretty sure it's physical mail the sun was a reader contributed journal and it had an essay in it called the six lesson school teacher yeah i used to yeah um, and the six lesson school teacher by john taylor gatto says nominally i'm your high school english teacher let me show you what i'm actually teaching your children i'm teaching them that they are how to conform little machines in the cog, that I am God in the classroom, all these things about what became known as the hidden curriculum of schooling. He was a big advocate of unschooling, right? So I started reading, looking up unschooling and diving into that and realizing that we don't trust kids to be curious. We don't trust kids to learn. We don't trust anybody in the system. So we build a coercive system that forces every kid into a, a classroom that's 20 to 50 kids big <clears throat> with kids that happen to have been born within six months of each other. We create scarcity at every turn in the educational system because of the lack of trust, because there's so many kids and there's so much to learn. And oh my God, the only way you're going to actually get that done 
is through these coercive practices to force everybody into boxes, to, to then march in lockstep. So we teach everybody more or less. Uh, and luckily, there's lots of experimentation now with other things. But if you um, sort of trusted the system and then figured out how to, there's, there's always going to be breaches of trust, always, always, always. But if you start with trust and design that system and scaffold learners of any age to go learn shit and then figure out how to have sages at the side available who say, you know, it smells like you're going to want to learn this thing over here and this thing over there. Would you consider that? Because otherwise people don't learn, they don't know what they need, but they don't know what they don't know. So, uh, you know, we need mirrors and all that. But we could redesign the entire educational system if we started from trust. And then you can lather, rinse, repeat that on every sector of the human economy and, and activity. And that's my thesis with design from trust. And I'm, if you go to design from trust, you'll see a couple of videos. <clears throat> and, and if I could wave a magic wand, I would teach everybody that and, and help them implement it. Because everything else I'm doing with mind mapping and whatever else is nice to have, but doesn't change anybody's mind, uh, really. Cool, yeah, Sudbury schools, uh, unschooling. Self unschooling is a lousy, lousy term because it's a negative. Uh, Self-directed education is a nicer term. Uh, there's a, you know, a bunch of other ways of, of looking at this. Um, but I got, I got radicalized on that. And then, sorry, and then that opened me up to the idea that, oh, wait a minute, this is really about trust. And once you have a little taste of this trust thing, and so the reason I use Wikipedia as an example a lot is that when people realize that Wikipedia was designed from trust, they have this little light bulb go off in their head and they're like, oh shit, that's interesting. It sounds impossible and it works. How do, and I think they have this little feeling of how do I get more of that? But they don't know what other institutions have this little dynamic in common with Wikipedia. And there's tons. I have, a, I have thoughts called you know, examples of, of design from trust in my brain that, that I can share out. But, but there's like tons in what I discovered in sector after sector after sector after sector after sector. Uh, so Hans Mondermann traffic calming in Holland, who basically says, hey, if you redesign your intersections so that drivers, pedestrians, drivers, and bicyclists and motorcyclists need to make eye contact or they'll kill each other going through the intersection, um, which is an act of trust, you actually get the same throughput in a much safer intersection. The accident rate goes down because people actually had to pace themselves to, to, to make their way through, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, I've, been, I've been finding examples of this that, and how it works in the world for 25 years with a couple of distractions along the way. And totally happy to, to riff endlessly on this in different ways. Would actually like to write a book about this. Uh, would at this point love to have an experimental book that is made up of nuggets that are playlists, that are, that are chapters in a playlist that are output by the, the, the basically flexible in, uh, writing environment that Pete is prototyping. And, one reason why I might in fact be interested in shifting over to Obsidian to wrap like four previous conversations together is that um, it might be an interesting place to play with these theses, which sounds so much like theses, it's a word I hate to use, um, <clears throat> but to play with these theses in, in, you know, in the open and create artifacts that people recognize, namely like books and podcasts out of, out of the, the, the mess of, of ideas. Other than that, I got nothing. So it's interesting that we're talking about design from trust because I was going to wait till the weaving the world call to bring this up. But you keep talking about the secondary project. And I was going to say, you know, we kind of touched on it a little bit, but the idea of starting a production company, but designing it from trust. Um, and just putting it to like get bringing in people yeah. <laughs> that are working in that field and sort of simulate a company that would be doing the podcast, but maybe another podcast and then talking about, again, just designing it. So I can't even tell you how it would work because it would be about the design. And weave together a couple other things. Uh, Michael's here because he's talking about bit lattice the creator of BitLattice published a post about trust that he put in the chat a little while ago, so we can scroll back and find it, 
which starts with, hey, these blockchain-y things are known as trustless systems. And the uh, hybrida is looking to create something that completely doesn't need human trust. I think I might be misrepresenting yeah. here. Yes, and that that's that's what they said. The 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 piece that's missing from that, and where I will take issue in a careful follow-up conversation, because when I haven't been precise, it's been brutal. Um the um the that they it's not about tr it's the people trusting their instruments, right? It's about pilots trusting their instruments. People have yes, so BitLadis have created so that people don't have to trust each other. But people still have to trust BitLattice. And so what are the ways that we get people to do right. that? Right. And we're, they, trusting, we're trusting algorithms, right? That's the, yeah. it's not it's not that it's not that Bitcoin and blockchain are trustless. We're trusting all the algorithms that some mysterious person named Satoshi dropped on us. Right. And the best way to trust it is to be part of creating it. But there are other ways to trust it. Agreed. Which is part of this collaborative, playful generation of stuff. Pete. Um, Michael uh, Robbins, um, I I'm I, I find um, I'm a little frustrated with BitLattice uh, because I went to the website, uh, read the technical uh, overview, and didn't find any technical overview part. Um, it's uh, it it doesn't say how it works. It just says what you could do with it and why you would do it and things like that. So. Um, for better or for worse, um, I, I, I love that Jerry thinks that I'm smart enough to know about blockchain and, and math and stuff like that. I'm actually crappy at math. Um, so we'd end up having, I, the thing that I'm wishing I found is something that I actually probably couldn't read very well um, because it would be a lot of math and stuff like that. But, um, but just a, you know, just a kind of feedback up the chain. I, I, I wish I knew more about BitLattice. I, I don't know very much about it and I can't find much about it. And I'm pretty good at finding stuff. You know. And part of this and, and part of this is like our small test on stuff because Pete and I and several others here have seen a lot of software. I am I am not a geek or a programmer. Uh, Pete actually is like a certified card carrying. Um, but but there's sometimes you sort of see a project and you're like, oh, I totally get this and you can leap into it. And sometimes you're like, wait, wait, what what actually is happening behind the curtain? So I think we've I think we haven't gotten to the conversation we could have about uh, BitLattice, but we've started it. Um, I, uh, Mark, oh yeah, ahead, Michael. No, I did also just want to add. You talked about like creating playlists. <laughs> so that's what we did with district learning is we create a learning playlist, and it's um, it's focused on a particular pedagogical approach, if I can use that word, um, called connected learning, which is, um, you know, more than experiential learning. Um, and um, I'll share a, a quick thing on connected learning. Um, but, but, you know, if we're looking, so as I've been like, really like, there are times when I'm just like, I'm ready to give up on trying to explain this to people and like go work on a, a commune, I don't know. Um, but, um, you know, it's like looking at how we could cre create playlists to explain all these different pieces, but, you know, have people, you know, chew through the playlists. I put a link to some of those, to some playlists that are really good from the National Writing Project on our LRNG platform that show you some great examples of what playlists can look like. Um, because I could sit and write a book. I, I've written, uh, Grammarly just told me that I've written 1.5 million words over the last, I don't know, 16 months, right? That's um, a bunch of books. That's a lot of books, right? But nobody's going to read it. Um, and, and it's not actionable. So, like, I think the playlist may be a way to get people to think about it as um, from the creator seat instead of the consumer seat. Love that and, and and we're sort of all hunting <clears throat> we're all trying to find our way to the right set of tools the right platforms and all that and michael i think your 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 quest is is like very similar to our quest we're like crap what do we build this participative collaborative um uh collectively built environment in uh so that it is trustworthy and so that it honors humans and their ability to build trust with one another and and doesn't instead alienate them from each other as i think that blockchain can do easily, uh, you know, the idea that the word trustless associated with all this really disturbs me a lot.
First, because it's actually not trustless, we're trusting the algorithms. But second, because the idea that you know money plays this role too. Money, money alienates us from each other. Because I, if I give you five bucks, that's that's the same five bucks you can spend on a burrito down the road. Then we, I don't care. It's arm's length, and we can forget about each other afterward. And I think we're in an environment where it'd be nice if we had a little bit more stickiness. There's a in in some community around the earth. I've forgotten where it is. Uh, there's a welcoming ritual where somebody will come greet you and give you a gift. It might be bread and salt or something like that. That's a that's a, a habit in Germany. But but then the right way to respond, the right response is not to give them back anything of equivalent value. You want to respond with something of higher or lesser value because if you respond with something of equal value, you've eliminated the link the link between you. You've kind of scrubbed the accounts. Uh, but by always leaving a little imbalance in what was gifted back and forth, create a relationship, right? It's really subtle. It's really, really interesting. And I love it uh, because, because it, it, you know, equivalence, which we think of as, okay, good. That was a fair exchange. And now we're done uh, actually breaks the ties. And you want there to be a little lingering tie in the background. Like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that sort of uh, makes that work. Cranial retentives. <laughs> That's very funny, Michael. Um, so we've gone, we've slipped over our hour. Uh, uh, this has been super juicy and interesting. And thank you for playing uh, on the call. Uh, any sort of lingering thoughts or things to put on the table now? Whenever I hear the word software, I reach for my checkbook. Um, uh, um, the original quote. Mark. The original quote is, uh, of course, from uh, um, I think Goebbels. Or whenever I hear the word culture, I reach for my gun. Um, mm -hmm. I um, certainly, uh, as a software developer. Do not trust software as far as I can throw it. Um, it's and not that throwable. I I certainly um, you know react in fear, um, the name of a band, um, and I certainly um, come from the punk aesthetic where um, humans have emotions. Boy, do they have emotions! Some of these emotions are you know um, we we had this kind of play of the term sacred and um sacred rage um was what i encountered the next day after that um uh in in connection with um carl polanyi um so you know, polanyi i believe yeah mm -hmm. um sorry but if, one of my uh, heroes that's okay interesting yeah so so that kind of you know that's a, I don't want to not look at the dark stuff. My favorite mm -hmm. definition of an artist is you don't have to look away. If you're an artist, if, if I'm an artist, that means I don't have to look away at, at, at something that somebody wants me to look away at. Um, and I, I, I can't look away at software as a human creation and as flawed as every other human creation and trust is something that's a variable in that equation um but um I, yeah I, I i i don't trust the blockchain i don't trust um uh um google i don't trust the internet um you know um well I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure how to um, react to this expect from the uh, um, thing I first posted in the uh, um, uh, chat. Um, the fear song, Let's Have a War, um, comes from my punk background. It's violent um, and uh, it's fun as hell. <laughs> Where do you live, Mark? Um, San Francisco, California. Man, you know, I, I, was at a, I, was, I was at a very loud old school punk show in DC last Saturday. Yeah, I, I appreciate that that reality check. Like, you know, 
look at look look and you know put in the earplugs but just keep going i i almost was uh able to go to uh a band that i've known for over 30 years the incredible shrinking dickies at the ivy room in uh, uh albany except like um, a cold water band it's it's an amazing band there's uh the song stuck in a pagoda with trisha toyota um you drive me ape you big gorilla you drive me ape ape i want to tell you that and it's 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 this kind of music and i didn't want to do a line of cocaine to you know basically drive to the east bay and stay up all night it's it's not I can't do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, I, and I chose not to, uh, probably wisely, but, um, you know, there's the COVID thing about indoors and, you know, singing at the top of your lungs. It's just, it, it couldn't be a spiritual upper. Um, but, huh. Huh. Motivation and emotion and and trust um jerry thank you for design with trust um you said it before but it didn't stick with me um actually designed from trust on purpose from trust yeah so so you yep. put it in, in that and so i'll i'll follow i'll follow into that i'll thank you and thanks stacy and, and michael michael hank pete um i'll try to wake up early earlier tomorrow <laughs> awesome um Thanks, Mark. Anyone else? A wrapping word? You don't have to say it in rap. I just want to uh, try to weave what Mark was saying um, or weave into what Mark was saying about the about well, let me <sighs> let me see if I can put this in words. I, I'm thinking about I'm still thinking about the um, the intersection between your instruments and and your control of your own space and view of external space, um, and that that the the sovereignty of your and, and knowledge of and trust in your mind, your instruments, your, your purview, your knowledge purview is kind of a prerequisite for trust in the sense that, you know, to be able to, um, to be able to, to also filter outwards, um, to say, I am going to um, uh, design from trust, with trust, through, through design, from. sorry, from. from, yeah, from, from, from trust about this with these people um, because I know I, I feel that direction. I know myself on this. I have learned from the sharing from those other people as the other people on this. And we have this avenue for trust because of it that we wouldn't if we were, or we wouldn't come to as easily if we were in the noisy, unfiltered, non-sovereign space that, we too often inhabit, inhabit, or are forced into. That's my thought. I did a little, <laughs> thanks, Michael. I did. I did a little video about why it's from, not for trust. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, yeah, Michael. What I heard you saying in there is that trusting is also trusting yourself, which we've been taught not to do as well. Yeah. Like socialization. The socialization we grow up in, which we are trained to think of as the pinnacle of civilization, is really devastating. I mean, like we're socialized to become good consumers and to not trust ourselves and to not think we're ever beautiful or good enough. I mean, our, we have a very harsh, uh, cruel kind of culture that we take as being 
this this paragon of virtue and the peak of civilization. It's like very strange. I also just want to add, Jerry, when you were giving that example of um, when the people slowed down, that there's more to that. It's also the eye contact. It's not just that they slowed down that caused the less, you know, it's having to look at somebody. Yep. Yep. That's right. I, 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 so um, I, I, on the Design from Trust site, you'll find an essay called The Two O Shits, which I really like. Uh, and it's basically there's pickable responses when a human meets a system designed from trust. And I'll plot spoiler, my apologies. Leave now if you don't want to have this spoiled for you. But um, the first oh shit is, oh shit, this is impossible. This couldn't possibly work. It's like, what do you mean any idiot on earth can change any page on Wikipedia? What, what fool had that idea? What do you mean you're taking away stoplights and traffic lights and that somehow is going to make the, the traffic better? What idiot did that? And then you go through it and you realize, oh shit, this, the, the second oh shit is, oh shit, this is working. How do I get more of this? Like, wow, that's, in, that's insane. Like, like this, this really works. Cool. Well, gentle friends, I think it may be time to wrap this call. Um, this club meets regularly on Tuesday mornings. Uh, Michael, thank you for joining us. Thanks for taking up the invite. And um, yeah, more soon. Yeah. Well, rugby, like rugby is a controlled brawl, right? And they don't do the pads and helmets. And it's like insane what happens on a rugby field. I remember there was a bumper sticker when in, my, in my undergrad, give blood, play rugby. Okay. So it's, I guess it's not that nonviolent after all. No, it's um, not, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's pretty damn violent. I've been in the middle of that. Yep. <laughs> I, I, I did some work in Australia in 2016 and became a fan of the All Blacks. So one of my guilty pleasures is watching All Blacks on YouTube. Yeah, hakas. And I've also then become a fan of a haka. So just, just so everybody knows, like when I pass, part of my instructions are I'd love there to be a haka at my whatever. Even a virtual one would be fine. But Rohan, being, Ro, being... Ro, Rohan Light, um, who I think I may have connected you with, Jerry, in Wellington, New Zealand, would be a marvelous participant in this discussion as well. I know we don't want oh, to get cool. it big, but I'll, um, I'll, um, let me just, um, let's start by um, me putting his, uh, his info in the chat. Um, he and I have been talking for months um, and uh, just amazing. A lot about um, ownership um, and um, indigenous societies, um, talking about awesome. um, first Americans and uh, the Maori. Okay, that sounds beautiful. And I don't think, I don't remember his name, so I'm not, I'm not sure you've mentioned him. Too yeah, I'm, okay, let me just, um, sorry, quickly here. Yeah, thanks. That's perfect. See you, Stacey. I'm going to listen in the background. <laughs> oh, Rohan Light, thank you. Um, fabulous. And, I, and uh, all that, those ways of thinking about ownership differently and about trust differently are essential to this place we're moving into. And one of the things that scares me a lot is that so much of the energy of this place we're moving into is Mark Zuckerberg's vision of the metaverse is Satoshi's vision of cryptocurrencies and blockchains is about trustlessness, is about a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't feel uh, connected in the ways that I feel like it needs to be. So I'm, I'm wondering who's actually doing the connecting one. One of the reasons I like Arthur Brock and Holochain is that some of the relationship sort of factors into how Holochain stores and remembers stuff, which I like. Uh, oh, cool, thank you. Hakas are beautiful. Hakas are like moving. It's an honor to receive a haka. Like, like, yeah. So thanks, everybody. Have great days. Thanks for starting this off with such fun, Pete. Really appreciate it.